Brothers and sisters, very warm greetings to all of you. Today we will be discerning and reflecting on the third part of our Advental preparation, this talk about the Eucharist. We will today discern, we will be today talking about the Real Presence. Bread, of he bread from heaven given to us. I would like to come back again to this text from Lumen Gentium. The Holy Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The source and summit of the Christian life. Our strength, our reality as Christians, derives from Eucharist and leads to the Eucharist. Eucharist embraces everything we are as Christians because we belong to Christ and Jesus is the Eucharist. Today topic um, Today's topic is uh, the Eucharist, the loving presence of the resurrected Lord, the meaning of the word memorial, and the real presence in church's history and teaching. Let's therefore, brothers and sisters, focus on what we are going to do, but let us ask Holy Spirit to come and fill our hearts, because from Him the truth comes. Come, Holy Spirit, and let us acknowledge your power, your life, your love. Let us be open to your will. To you be all glory and praise forever. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his exceeding greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with timbrel and dance, praise him with strings and pipes, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing elf cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Alleluia. Amen. I mentioned that today we will start with the word um, memorial because that is a very key word for us to deepen our understanding what is happening during the Eucharist. This Hebrew word zakar means to recall or to represent before God an event in the past so that it becomes here and now, operative by its effects. Greek translation of Bible uses the word anamnesis. In the sense of Holy Scripture, the memorial is not merely the recollection of the past events, but the proclamation of the mighty works wrought by God for man. In the liturgical celebration of these events, they become in a certain way present and real. This is how Israel understands its liberation from Egypt. Every time Passover is celebrated, the Exodus events are made present to the memory of the believers so that they may conform their lives to them. They become you know, they become present. In the New Testament and in the time of the Church, the memorial takes on a new and deeper meaning. The Catechism explains, when the Church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover and it is made present. The sacrifice of Christ offered once for all on the cross remains ever-present. 
the Catechism refers to the Eucharist as the sacrificial memorial of Christ and explains that the Mass is a sacrifice because it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, about which, about which we spoken last week. In the memorial of this, not simply, it is not memorial of this simply, but it calls it to mind and, and calls it to mind, but because the liturgical celebration, um, the events of the cross of that night and Jesus' suffering uh, become truly present. What's happened there, the whole passion of our Lord and his death happens during the Mass. Jesus doesn't, does not die again, but as we heard just before, that what happened in the past becomes present now. Therefore, Eucharist is the suffering of Christ, his sacrifice for our salvation. This is why it is the most sacred and most profound prayer, most profound moment during our week, during our day, if we go to Mass. Let us do remember how sacred, how profound is that event we are participating in. This is why the word memorial, understanding of this memory, firstly in Jewish tradition and in the first church, is so crucial for us to deepen our understanding what we are experiencing. We often, we're going to the church from our childhood and we go and we go and we go, not always having possibility, sometimes not having desire to deepen this meaning. And it is fascinating how, um, how God works in our lives, lives, opening all these depths for us. Therefore, let us remember that this memorial, do this in memory of me, which we hear during Mass, means that this what's happening is the passion of Jesus Christ. It is reenacted, it is present. The following question I think quite um, important is what is transubstantiation? And I think that we need to focus a bit more um, on that uh, word and its meaning. Unfortunately, we need to go to some extent to, um, uh, to um, ontology and metaphysics. In ontology and also in metaphysics, important um, element of discussion is being. Being means the material or immaterial existence of, of a thing. Anything that exists is a being. In Greek we call this ousia, and in Latin substantia, a substance. So, for example, the laptop I use is a being. I am a being. My glasses are, is a being. My collar is a being. Even, for example, something what we know from some sort of tales, let's say the Thor, which is very famous, is a being. Um, unicorn is a being. Something what doesn't exist in a way in a natural world, but exists in our mind, exists in memory and in imagination of, of human beings. Because 
when I say, say about when I say about unicorn, though they don't exist, we know what I'm talking about. If I'm speaking about Thor, many of us would know whom about I'm talking. So these all are beings. Important is to um, understand also in metaphysics what substance is. To substance is this particular being, this being. For example, this Father Tomas or this computer. And when we speak about substance, firstly, it relates to a particular existing thing. For instance, as I mentioned before, and using other examples, a rose or a cat. Or it also can refer to substantial form of a particular existing thing. For instance, a shape of a rose and a shape of a cat or shape of Father Tomas or shape of this laptop. Important to understand transubstantiation are these two words, but also word accident. In philosophy, in metaphysics, accident is an attribute that may or may not belong to a subject, to a being, without affecting its existence. For instance, it can be a small indoors rose or a big outdoor rose. Rose is rose. If it is small and grows in our rooms or big one and grows outside, still is the rose. The size doesn't take away rose being rose, rosiness of the rose. And second example, a cat. We can have a Siamese cat, or Persian cat, or white cat, or spotted cat. And neither of these differences takes away catness from the cat. So accidents are these things which are additional, but if they are taken away, doesn't change what the thing is in itself. I would repeat once again. An accident is something what belongs to the subject, to something, but if it is not there, doesn't make the things, the thing not exist. An example could be a cat which is white. If the cat was dark, black or spotted, it wouldn't take away this difference, wouldn't take away its cutness, because we can have white or black cat. White cat is a cat and black cat is a cat. If we are wearing, if, for example, someone has blue eyes and the other person has brown eyes, it doesn't change the fact that the person is a human. This is something which doesn't make, uh, it is not essential for a being, for a thing, to be called what, he, what, what it is. I hope I didn't 
um, I clarify to other things but not make it more difficult for that. The word transubstantiation has been chosen during the fourth Lateran, Lateran Council in 1215 in order to describe this particular transformation of bread and wine into body and blood of Jesus Christ. The word means a change of the substance of bread and wine into body and blood of our risen Lord. The taste and appearance of wine and bread after, uh, after consecration is called an accidental appearance. This is why these words substance and accident is really important. Accidental appearance, so what, how it looks, how it tastes, doesn't, um, doesn't describe or define what it is after consecration because this is an accidental part. These are accident of the being which is, which is present, Jesus Christ. This notion is not only revealed by God because Jesus said that this is his body, this is his blood, but also is most fitting, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Why? Because this reality allows the Church and all of us individually to experience perpetual presence of Christ. Can we recall this perpetual bread from the last meeting? Perpetual dew towards God as a sign of the covenant. Covenant is a, um, a relationship, is something between two parties to agree the way they deal with each other. And it is sacred a covenant, so creating union and relationship, perpetual relationship, we heard last week uh, regarding 12 breads. So here we see again to experience perpetual presence of Christ through our journey towards eternity and his coming in a tangible way. In, in a tangible way, we experience God's presence and it is help for us on the journey. Do we recall, we can recall now the, our first talk about manna, when manna was given for the time of journey from the slavery of Egypt to the promised land. This reality of transubstantiation increases our faith in Christ and in his real presence among us and is a wellspring of grace where we participate in Jesus' divine love. In his uh, glorified risen body. Important for us to understand transubstantiation would be describing, reflecting on how something can become present in a new way in a particular place because we know that body, that bread and wine becomes body and blood of Christ. How it happens that something becomes present in a particular place in a new way. First of all, there are two ways of uh, realization that. First, it's moving to another place, like moving from a home to church or from London to Paris. The other is a changing of substance. For instance, boiling water changes into steam. A new substance is generated through some action. 
Jesus neither changes his place nor he is generated. Because Jesus exists already in his risen body. He cannot change, does it, his, him becoming on the altar doesn't mean that he comes from heaven and become present at that very altar and is not present in heaven. Jesus is present in heaven and in all tabernacles and on all altars where Mass is celebrated throughout the world. Because Jesus is not divided, he cannot be, it doesn't work that parts of Jesus goes to that church, to that tabernacle, the other part goes to other. Jesus is in his resurrected, glorified body. And he um, is present, as I mentioned, in all the churches throughout the world, on all the altars, and, and is present in heaven. It is a miracle. Yes, what we can say more, how does it work really? If God is omnipotent, there is no limitation for his actions. If God is almighty, there is no limitations for his actions and none of these actions is illogical because as an absolute God is not tied to the logic we are tied to as created creatures. This reality of transubstantiation is possible to grasp in faith because what we see denies what we would understand. What we see is more than we can grasp by the power of our reason. However, in comparison we can say if we believe that Jesus was conceived without a presence of a man and we believe that what well, that happened and this is true and we embrace that truth logically naturally that is impossible however this happened if we believe the truth that, and we know the truth that Our Lady, uh, of Our Lady's perpetual virginity, how it is possible. We know that this is truth. So here also we help, we have the help of to understand our faith, faith as a manner of understanding, not as a something what fills the gaps. This presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is unique, as in some way was manna, about which we discussed in our first meeting. Jesus wanted to be present in a unique way, because what he did for us is a unique way of showing us his love and he desired to, to this to be in the in an extraordinary way for our sake as a gift for us to show us how God is concerned about us We know that the transubstantiation truth is given to us by the Church, but Church gives to us what she received, the truth 
revealed by Jesus Christ. Church is led by the Holy Spirit who guides her to the fullness of truth. And we read in Luke 22, 19, Institution of the Eucharist, Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus says, This is my body, giving them something what looks like and tastes like bread. Furthermore, in first letter to Corinthians, St. Paul writes, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And further down, he says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. St. Paul clearly states that this is real presence of Jesus Christ in this what looks and tastes like, bo like bread. And those who do not believe that, reject, reject that truth or ignore that, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. Saint Ignatius of Antioch writes in about 106 um, to Roman Christians, he says, I desire the bread of God, the heavenly bread, the bread of life, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became afterwards of the seed of David and Abraham, and I desire the drink of God, namely his blood, which is incorruptible love and eternal life. Ignatius very clearly states the truth of real presence, and that happens just after death of Saint John the Baptist. John the Apostle. So the truth is given to the Church from the, from the beginning. Furthermore, let us listen to St. Augustine. From Mary's flesh he took flesh, and because in his very flesh he walked on earth, and because his very flesh he gave us to eat for our salvation, and no one eats that flesh unless he has first adored it. We find how, and not only do we, uh, we do not sin by adoring, but we sin by not adoring. Whom we adore, ad to adore to worship means latria. Only God is worshipped. And here Augustine says, about adoring what we are going to eat, adoring the body of Christ which we receive. He clearly states that this is Jesus' flesh and we are to adore, adore God physically present in his resurrected body among us. Gregory the Great amazing Pope and very holy a uh, person um, describes that situation. When he was distributing Holy Communion, a woman laughed aloud. When she was asked about the reason for such behaviour, she replied, I laughed when I heard that this is the body of Christ, because I baked this bread myself. When St. Gregory knelt down and asked all present to pray for a woman of faith, for a woman for faith for her. And the host suddenly transformed into a real body, and that woman believed. We 
we do have in um, in Italy two places Orvieto and Lanciano where we um, experience this miracle of the host becoming <clears throat> a flesh those who doubt it in the real presence experience that change if any one of those who are watching uh, today will be there in Italy in Orvieto or Lanciano um, I would encourage them to go to these shrines to um, to the um, to to experience that presence of Jesus Christ which was given to those who doubted in the truth that the body, the bread, the, the thing which looks like bread and tastes like bread after consecration is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. In 11th century, Berenger of Tours, a priest working there, stated that Jesus cannot be physically present in the bread and wine consecrated since he is re his, he in his risen body is in heaven. He would rather welcome an idea that Jesus is spiritually present in bread and wine. His views were condemned and Berenger had to revoke his ideas and publicly profess his faith in transubstantiation. The difficulty for him was that the idea um, uh, difficulty for him was that the idea taught by the church did not, in his view, correspond with the truth of Jesus' presence after the resurrection. If Jesus ascended to heaven and we are awaiting his second coming, how can he come um, all the time on the altars? Here we have two selections of his um, confession to which he was obliged, in one in uh, 1059 and later on in 1079, because he refused to believe even if he um, confessed the presence of Jesus Christ. In 1264, Pope Urban IV established a feast of Corpus Christi. In a statement made for this occasion, the Bula Transitorus de Hocmundo, Pope confirmed the faith and the fact that the Church passes from the Last Supper, that the Eucharistic species represent the actual body and blood of the Saviour and for this reason deserve honour, respect and worship. Things became quite complicated with the Reformation. Martin Luther in 1528 writes Why then should we not much more say in the Supper this is my body, even though bread and body are two distinct substances. And the word this indicates the bread. Here too, out of two kinds of objects, a union has taken place, which, which I shall call a sacramental union, because Christ's body and the bread are given to us as a sacrament. This is not a natural or personal union, as it is in the case with God and Christ. It is also perhaps a different union from that which the dove has with the Holy Spirit and the flame with the angel, but it is also assuredly a sacramental union. What Martin Luther tries to um, convey is that the bread 
which um, people receive has Jesus in it, but this is not um, a physical presence of Jesus. This is not the body of Christ. Zwingli taught that Jesus is present in the Eucharist species in a purely symbolic way, since Christ said, do this in the remembrance of me. Here is this sort of misunderstanding of the word remembrance, memorial in Hebrew. Calvin explains this in terms of believers' mystical union with Christ. Just as a baptism is, is connected with the believer's initiation into union with Christ, the Lord's Supper, he says, strengthens the believer's ongoing union with Christ. According to Calvin, the sacrament are signs. The signs and the things signified must be the, the things the signs and the things signified must be distinguished without being separated. Calvin rejects the idea that sacramental signs are merely symbols. Doesn't really, there is no presence of Jesus like Zwingli did. But also he rejects the idea that the signs are transformed into the things they signify as church believes. Calvin argues that when Christ uses the words, this is my body, the name of the thing signifies body, is applied to bread. So, seem to be that what we, when person receives something what is called bread, which is called body, it is body of Christ, but it is not real body of Christ. There is this spiritual, mystical reality transferred in that moment on that person. In England, Henry VIII, um, though he has broken unity had broken unity with Pope, with the Pope, kept many essentials of the Catholic doctrine, including transubstantiation. This was enshrined in the six articles from 1539, and there was a death penalty specifically prescribed for any who denied transubstantiation. However, this Things changed under Elizabeth I, and in the 39 articles from 1563, there were laws en enacted against participation in Catholic worship, which remained illegal until 1791. From 1672, to 1822, transubstantiation had an important role in a negative way in British political and social life. Under the Test Act, the holding of, a holding of any public office was made conditional upon explicitly denying transubstantiation. Any aspirant to public office had to repeat the formula set out by the law, which sounds as follows. I do not, de do not do declare that I do believe that there is not any transubstantiation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper or in the elements of the bread and wine, at or after the consecration thereof by any person whatsoever. Can we see how the truth which is revealed and passed on from the beginning was attacked? 
The response to um, Reformation was Council of Trent. On October 11th, 1551, in the decree on the sacrament of the Eucharist, in Chapter 4, Council Fathers stated that the doctrine of transubstantiation is a dogma of faith, and they stated, by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, um, uh, this change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. Second Vatican Council in Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium repeated teaching of the Council of Trent and confirmed the faith of the Church in the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ, specifying that the Eucharist as the sacrament is the sacrament of love and unity. Later on, Pope Paul VI, now saint, just before end of the Council developed its ideas in the encyclical letter Mysterium Fidei. In this document, Pope made an analysis of the Catholic tradition of the Eucharistic cult. Starting from words of Jesus, who established the sacrament of his body and blood, Pope also recollected the testimony of the Fathers of the Church and Papal decrees and stated, stated over centuries, specifically, specifically those promulgated during the Council of Trent. This document is not long and very beautiful. Mysterium Fidei is very easily accessible on the Vatican website. Paul VI encouraged and obliged the faithful to worship and praise to the forms of the sacred body and blood of Jesus Christ. Paul, John Paul II, saint now, in his letter Dominicane, Dominique Cane, eh, addressed eh, to the bishops of the Church, highlighted the importance of the faith and worship of the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ. Catechism of the Catholic Church in Numbers 1380-1381 states, The Church and the world have a great need for Eucharistic worship. Jesus awaits us in the sacrament of love. Let us not refuse the time to go to meet him in adoration, in contemplation full of faith and open to making amends for the serious offences and crimes of the world. Let our adoration never cease, that in this sacrament are the true body of Christ and, the tr and his true blood is something that cannot be apprehended by the senses, Saint, uh, says St. Thomas, but only by faith, which uh, relies on divine authority. For this reason, in a commentary on Luke 22.19, This is my body which is given for you, Saint Cyril says, Do not doubt whether this is true, but rather receive the words of the Saviour in faith, for since he is the truth, he cannot lie. Sad information is that many American Catholics do not believe in the real presence, and I presume that the, thing, the same thing happens throughout the world and also among the Catholics in Great Britain. I hope that today's subject was clear. If any one of you has any questions or comments, please do leave them beneath. Let us pray for the gift of faith in real presence. If we doubt, 
let us pray that Jesus may strengthen our faith, so that we may be open for this gift as much as is it needed for our salvation. To God may be praise and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us pray together this prayer. My Divine Lord, I firmly believe that I receive in Holy Communion your body, blood, soul and divinity. I believe this because you have said it, and I am ready to maintain this truth at the peril of my life. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for listening. I'm Father Tomasz from St. Joseph Parish in Bromley. God bless.